Hello, I'm Tony Guider. This is my New York. My guest today is a man who has devoted his life to making the lives of others better. 41 years ago, he co-founded an organization with the mission to eradicate hunger and poverty in this country. And 41 years ago, he launched a local radio program offering comfort to the afflicted. His name is Bill Ayers. His deeds are exceptional. You'll meet him next. I am delighted to welcome to the program Bill Ayers, and I guess in the spirit of full disclosure, I should mention, uh, besides his great accomplishments, he's a good friend. Yes, yes. Uh, it's, it's been a wonder. Uh, Tony and I uh, do the hunger -thon every year on CBS 880, raise a lot of money to uh, help hungry people, and uh, we love working together. Yeah, and, uh, and you're, pretty, you're pretty good at it. Yeah, well, we've been doing it. We did the first one. Harry Chapin and I did the first hunger thon in, on d the old NEW when it was a classic yeah, rock station. What a great radio station. station. Yeah, in 1975. Well, I think we should back up because you're getting into one of the two areas that I, uh, uh, we want to talk about today. Sure. Bill co-founded with... Harry Chapin. Harry Chapin, an organization called Why Hunger in 1975. In thumbnail, what is Why Hunger? Well, we're a grassroots support organization. We work with thousands of organizations all over the country and now dozens around the world. But most of our work is right here in the United States. We do have that one program, which we'll talk about later, called Imagine There's No Hunger, which we do with Yoko Ono Lennon, and uh, which has been very, very effective. But when we started, we were actually interested in uh, international hunger because uh, I knew that there was a uh, terrible drought in the Sahelian region of Africa, the part right under the Sahara Desert. So mm -hmm. all the way from Addis Ababa to Dakar, there were about 14 million people who were in danger of starvation. And uh, I, you know, I, I didn't know what to do about this. What am I gonna do, you know? And so I was up at uh, Marinol, uh, uh, which is a Catholic missionary mm -hmm. order, very, very good group of people. And I was watching these uh, horror films all day of starving children and whatever because I, I had been doing a series of shows right. for a local station here, television shows, and I wanted to get some background, some visuals. I got visuals, all right. And I, I came out of there and I, I sat in a car and I cried. My head was about to explode. I said, well, you know, I got to do something about this. I had no clue what to do. I, I was sort of a veteran of the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement and the poverty movement here in the United States, but I hadn't done anything internationally. So uh, then I, about a month later, I met Harry. How did you meet? Uh, he came on my radio show, 1973. And um, I, I was doing a network radio show for ABC called On This Rock, a little play on words. And it was, uh, I was interviewing rock and roll people. So I, I wound up doing the first uh, network radio show with Bruce Springsteen, did shows with Billy Joel. But, but the most important one, I have to say, was with Harry Chapin. And after he said, wow, that was good. He said, uh, well, uh, we should work together. He said, uh, come to my house for dinner. And that's how yeah. it started, yeah. And <clears throat> together you, well, you found that he had a similar interest in this, in this subject. Obviously. Yeah, I, well, I talked to him about the concert first. And, uh -huh. uh, he, loved, he loved the idea. And we went to the UN and it didn't, didn't quite work out. I won't go into details. <laughs> they wanted to do it, <clears throat> but they kind of messed it up. But it was a concert. Similar to, to the Bangladesh concert uh -huh. that George Harrison did. And Harry would say, well, I'm no George Harrison, but let's try it. And it didn't work out. But we, what we learned from that was that even if we had done a concert and raised a million dollars, and, and even if we had done that every night for a year, which, of course, we could never have done, it was a drop in the bucket in terms of what we needed. So we both made a decision that we would spend the rest of our lives fighting hunger and poverty. That was, you know, that was going to be our mission. And Harry had this idea of starting an organization. And we did in 1975. And at the time, we didn't know that, of course, that Harry was going to die in 1981. Right. Tragic car accident. And, 38? Uh, he was 38? Yeah, yeah, young man, young man. He thought he was going to live forever, you know. He's, he yeah. came we, from a, we all do. Well, he came from a family of people who lived until they were 80s and 90s, you right. know. And, but uh, it, it, that, that's what killed him. Yeah. Very, very sad. But uh, uh, everybody thought the work would end with, with him dying. 
because I, I had no ability to raise money. And, uh, but his family and I said, we're not going to let this happen. So we kept going. And they haven't. Um, yeah. The family is very much his, uh, his uh, brother, his children, very and much his, And his wife. And his wife, yeah. uh, very much involved. The organization is called Why Hunger, and you can find them, obviously, online. Whyhunger.org. Whyhunger.org. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned Hunger Thon. This is your major uh, fundraising effort Absolutely. of the year, which, yeah, is, yeah. Which, which you perhaps have heard of. And if you haven't, tell us more. Well, I got this idea in 1975 of going on the radio, taking over a radio station, I mean, you know, and uh, do, doing a 24-hour uh, radiothon, which I called the Hungerthon. So I went to my boss at PLJ at the time, and he said, no, we don't do that. WPLJ on 95.5? Yes, yeah, yes. Right. And, and I'd been on there for a couple of years, and uh, he and I got along very well together, but he didn't want to do that. So uh, I said to my friend Pete Fornatal, whom you and I knew, uh, he and I started radio together. And he was on NEW. I said, what about NEW? He said, well, let's go talk to Mel, meaning Mel Carmazin. Right. So we did. Mel said, sure. Who's, a, who's become a giant. In, Absolutely. In he was a general manager at the time of NEW. And he gave us his radio station for a whole day on Thanksgiving weekend, 1975. We, went on, we stayed up all night. We did the whole thing. And we, we did it every year for three years. And then we took him around the country. And we weren't raising money in those days. We weren't smart enough to do that, I guess. But Harry was raising the money. So what we were doing was raising consciousness. And uh, right from the beginning, we believed that the root cause of hunger was poverty. And the root cause of poverty is powerlessness. So helping people to gain power in their lives, helping uh, poor people to get some power in our country so that they wouldn't be poor, has been our goal. So, you know, people say, well, you're an anti-hunger organization. And that's absolutely true. So this, what does that mean? Fear I, and we should point out, and I, I think it's clear from Bill's <coughs> remarks, this is not a feeding organization. No. It's not a soup, soup kitchen, a national soup kitchen. It's what you're talking about. Right. And, I'm, and I'm moved to ask if you can give us some examples of how mm -hmm. you're, you've tried to empower the powerless. Well, a number of things. Um, you know, people say, well, you have to feed people. And our thought was, well, yes, you do. That's the f only the first step, though. It's just the first step. So food pantries, soup kitchens, they're all important. But you need to take the next step. So one of the things that, that we did, uh, we, I came up with this idea of um, a hotline, a New York mm -hmm. City hunger hotline. And we created the first hunger hotline in America. And then we realized that at the time, this was 1978, there were only 28 emergency food providers in all of New York City. How many do you think there are now? I, I don't know. It's probably about 12 or 1,300. But there were only 28 at the time. And so we helped to get that organized and getting churches and temples mm -hmm. and other organizations to start emergency food providers. But then what we did was to try to get them to ask the why question. You know, I come into your emergency food place, and you might ask me, well, why are you here? What's the problem? And then we can find out what the root cause is. Is it because I don't have a job? Is it because I'm homeless? Is it because I don't have childcare or healthcare or whatever? So we always have tried to work with the community-based organizations to get them to not just give people food, but to also help people get out of poverty. And then <clears throat> another thing that we did was to start a national hunger hotline so we ran that f uh, with the federal government for 20 plus years, and now we, we have our own. It's, uh, and folks, you can, you, if, you're, if you know somebody that's hungry, tell them to call uh, Why Hunger, W-H-Y-H-U-N. Uh, 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 you can text that, mm -hmm. and you can all, also call us at 1-800-5-HUNGRY, 1-800-5-HUNGRY. Right. And we have a texting service, and we can connect people to emergency food in their neighborhoods, but then to all the government feeding programs as well. Tell our audience, uh, uh, you know, we're obviously we're talking about a national and, of course, international problem, mm -hmm. but tell our audience, in the metropolitan area, right. uh, some organizations you've worked with or, or, or the p uh, organizations that pr people don't know, perhaps don't know about and should sure. know about. Oh, there's, there's so many that are wonderful. St. John's Bread and Life uh, over in Brooklyn. 
have a, they have a whole big building now, and I go over there, and, and they're a multi-service organization. I mean, they got the point that when people came in, you don't want to just give them a bag of food. That's what people started to do, but they're, they're very holistic. Uh, there's, there's also a West Side Campaign Against Hunger uh, up, uptown, and uh, there's wonderful organizations in Brooklyn that we work with, and in the Bronx, and Staten Island, Queens. They're all over the, they're all over the metropolitan area. But the ones that we work with that, we're, that we particularly like are ones that are helping people to get out of poverty and also doing some very innovative things. Uh, for example, there are wonderful community gardens going on uh, mm -hmm. all over the city now and backyard gardens and uh, community supported agriculture and farmers markets. All those things didn't exist 20, 30 years ago. And they've been growing ever since. And we've been right at sort of in the middle of that movement, helping to encourage people and to get support for them. But that's not just, that's in New York, but around the country, we've managed to, uh, we did a program some years ago called Reinvesting in America. And we went to every state and almost every city of size, also into rural areas and Appalachia and Native American reservations. And uh, we tried to identify programs that were going beyond just feeding people and helping people to promote self-reliance. And so we got a really good sense of what was going on around the country. And what we're doing now is working with groups uh, that are going beyond just feeding people. So for example, I had a conversation yesterday with a guy I got really excited about this. And I, I still get excited about all these years, Tony. That's this is a guy throws. out in San Diego, and he's been in working in nonprofit world for 30 years. But he's, he, you know, he joined the food bank uh, about five or six years ago. And he said to me, you know, it's not a food bank, it's a nutrition bank. I said, oh, really? What does that mean? And he said, well, it means we're getting healthy food to people. I said, yeah, that's great. And one of the problems that we've had in the hunger movement is that a lot of the uh, emergency food providers have gotten donations of food from big companies, food they wanted to get rid of, frankly. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't that good very little in terms of fruits and vegetables and uh, animal products and nuts and grains. This guy is doing that stuff, big time. And I was talking to him about a program that he has uh, that provides breakfast for kids. And he's done it, they have these backpacks that kids take home for the weekend. Uh, they, they do all kinds of things to help kids get breakfast. And that's one of the things that, that we've tried to do over the years is promote the, the breakfast program. And, and it's growing. Uh, uh, one of our board members is an expert on this, and she just did a whole update for us on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, now about half of the kids who get a free lunch are getting school breakfast. Much better than used to be, not far enough. So the story of this is, can you say, you said, well, have you been successful? Yes and no. Right. <laughs> you well, know, I, it's better. Yeah. It isn't where it needs to be. So the idea is to try to move all of these programs so they reach more people and they, and they help people get out of poverty. This guy said an interesting thing to me. He said, you know, I go by the old adage that when you eat, you learn. And when you learn, eventually you earn. And that's true. Mm -hmm. You know, kids don't learn if they're hungry. Every, all the studies have shown that. I, I, I heard a startling uh, statistic recently that the, the poverty rate of children mm -hmm. in this country is the it's highest scandal. in the world. In, in, the, in the industrial world. In the yeah. industrial world. Yeah. Of all the nations, yeah. uh, uh, advanced, so to speak, nations, right. the highest poverty rate among yeah. children is here in the right. United Absolutely. States. Absolutely. Which de it just defies belief. Yeah. Yeah. But well, now see, there's another dimension to this as well. And this is the poverty dimension, obviously. Kids are hungry because they're poor and kids are poor because their families don't make enough money. A lot of people think, well, you know, their families don't work. The vast majority of those kids are in working families. They're working families, but they're working for minimum wage. Uh, maybe it's a single parent or maybe it's not. Maybe it's a whole family, but the guy got laid off his job during the Great mm -hmm. Recession and he may be Making a, he may be in a job now that's making half or a third of what he made before. We get those calls. Uh, most of the calls we've gotten the hotline are from, from women 
Not, but in the past five or six years, we get calls from guys who said, I don't know what to do. I've never been in this situation before. You know, this is, this is the middle class. And uh, what can you do for somebody like that? Uh, well, we connect them, first of all, to emergency food in their neighborhood. That's just the first step, though. And then we try to connect them to an organization in their neighborhood that can help them to become self-reliant, to get a job or childcare or mm -hmm. health care or housing, whatever it may be. And there are these groups all over the country that do this. So we're, we're a grassroots support organization. And one of the things we try to do is to raise money for these folks. So our friend Bruce Springsteen, who's been our great partner in a right. program called Artists Against Hunger and Poverty. And uh, he doesn't talk about this much, but I do, because <laughs> you know he's, he's, he doesn't want to toot his own horn, but he's raised millions and millions of dollars for these community-based organizations. And any of you who go to a concert know that at the end of the concert, Bruce says, hey, on your way out, put some money in a basket out there. But he doesn't tell you that he's doing it big time. So he's probably raised, I don't know, $12, $13 million for these community-based organizations over the years. Let me ask you, Bill, if you, I mean, you've been doing this for 41 years mm -hmm. and uh, it's with this organization. Uh, do you sometimes or often feel like Sisyphus pushing the <laughs> rock up the hill, sure. but never to get there and sure. falling back? Yes and no. You know, I, I have great hope. I, I have great, great hope. And uh, I see the progress that's been made. I mean, just in the past uh, seven or eight years, uh, the poverty rate has gone down and the hunger rate has gone down. Not far enough. We, you know, mm. we're still talking about uh, tens of millions of people who are hungry and poor in this country, but it has gone down. And I don't think uh, President Obama got enough credit for that because uh, he saved us from what could have been a second Great Depression. It was a recession, right. but uh, you know, I mean, the poverty rate is down. The unemployment rate is half of what it was when he took office. And uh, people are actually making more money now. Again, still not good enough. Lots of people left behind. And of course, there is progress. Right. And of course, everybody knows that uh, Barack Obama is no longer our president. The name of our president is Donald Trump. And I'm wondering what you think is going to be the uh, effects of that in, 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 this, in this area. Well, I've, I've watched uh, all of the appointments that he's made. And the guy who's going to be the Secretary of Labor doesn't think that you should raise the minimum wage. What? Right. He's against, yeah. Now, Trump said during the campaign, yeah, we should raise it to $10 an hour. Hillary was saying, and Bernie Sanders was saying 15. She said 12. He, Sanders said 15. We're uh, talking about the federal, 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 exactly, federal minimum wage. Federal minimum wage. So if you have a guy who's now in charge of labor, and he says, well, we shouldn't raise the minimum wage, and we're saying that the root cause of hunger is poverty, then I think we're in big trouble. And that's just one appointment. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but, you know, uh, and then we've got... Uh, Paul Ryan, who thinks the answer to poverty is by cutting uh, what used to be called food stamps, now called SNAP. What? Yeah. I mean, he has a good idea of uh, trying to increase um, the uh, tax credit, which is, which is a great thing. Uh, and, I, and I think that's something that, that you know, we could work with him on uh, because that has helped to keep people, get people out of poverty, keep people out of poverty. That's a good program. But, uh, you know, Cutting off people from uh, SNAP, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, which is one of the most effective programs ever. It's been trashed by all kinds of people, but it, it's, it has helped. During the Great Recession, I saw this in the front page of the New York Times, a guy that I know who did that study said there were 8 million people in this country whose only income came from SNAP, from what was then food stamps. That's the only money they got. It wasn't money, but it was, they could buy food at least. Eight million people. Right. That was at the kind of the worst part. So you want to take that away from people? I don't think so. What you want to do is to gradually, and by the way, the number of people on SNAP now is decreasing as, as more people get jobs. And that's the way the program was made. You know, during a time of a great recession, like the one we had, the numbers went way up to 45, 46, 47 million people. They're going down now. And they'll continue to go down. And that's a good thing. But it's supposed to be there for people in their time of need. All these programs are, are based that way. I want to talk a little bit about your other life, which is uh, 
we talked about at the beginning of the pro program radio on the radio yes. and every night uh, every every week every sunday night sunday night um for 41 years and yeah. it's really two programs you do a community connection right, right. thing and then you do uh, you know call a show in which people call up and they're in distress yeah. uh, where did you what, what, where did that come from? I mean, is that well, part actually, of your background? Or you, uh, yeah, it is part of my background. But uh, the program director, uh, the same one who said he didn't want to do the Hunkathon, said to me one day, you know, I really like what you do. And he said, uh, this is the rock and roll show. He said, I think there's another show you could do. I said, what's that? He said, well, there's a guy out in Detroit, and I knew the guy. And he talks to young people on, on the radio late at night because they're troubled. He said, you could do that. I said, yeah, what time? He said, midnight. I said, midnight? He said, no, 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 no. This is New York City. There's a lot of people up at midnight. And he was right. You know, at, right. at one point. Midnight on WPLJ. Yeah. Every Sunday night. Every Sunday what, night. What kind of calls do you get? Well, I have a background in counseling, but you can't do counseling on the radio. What we do is we share insights. We share wisdom. We have people come on as guests uh, who bring wisdom as well. And uh, the show is about healing. You know, it's about healing. That's what my life is about, you know? I mean, on, on one level, it's the healing of society, hunger and poverty, but here you get an individual person calling. And, um, you know, like last weekend, I did a show about opportunities and obstacles. What are the opportunities in your life? Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, have you taken them? Did it work out? And what about obstacles? Well, I got a lot of calls. Almost all of them were about obstacles, not opportunities, <laughs> because people are hurting, you know. Uh, I got a lot of calls from people who are isolated, Tony. Isolated? Isolated, yeah. In, in what sense? Uh, socially, you know. They, they've gotten cut off from family. They don't have friends. They don't, you know. And so, so many people like that. Some of them are people who have been addicted. Some of them are people who have uh, emotional problems. And, I, you know, I'm not a psychiatrist. I can't deal on that level. What I do is sort of uncommon sense, you know, just trying to help people to deal with problems. And, um, you know, so I, you know, in, in a given night, I might have somebody who's got a marital problem, somebody else has a job problem, somebody else has a drug problem, and somebody else who wants to tell you how great their life is. Hmm. Great, you know, I mean, that's what it is. And I've been doing it all these years, and uh, it's a gift. You know, I, I've, I'm in awe of the people. I've probably talked to, over the years, I've probably talked to about, I kind of did a little calculation, it's not exactly right, but probably talked to about 30,000 people on the phone over mm. the years. Do you so. ever hear back from, I mean, you know, yeah. on the, I'm thinking of the talk, uh, uh, what do you call them, the sports radio shows yeah, yeah. where they, you know, they, some guy will call up today and say, you know, something about some team, sure. and then... Two weeks later, he calls back and you know calls again and says, "Hey, we were talking about this, but now I." Do you ever hear back from some of these? People? I do, I do, and some of them are really heartwarming. Just, oh, I mean, amazing. You know, I, I had a woman call me uh, who said to me, "You know, about 25 years ago, you saved my life." Really? I said, "How'd that happen?" She said, "Well, I was on this kind of retreat thing, and..." I came home, and uh, you were doing a show about rape, you know, and uh, she said, I realized that while I was on in this with these kids, I got raped, and I, mm. didn't, I didn't know, I was very innocent, very young, and she said, and you were saying, anybody like this needs to get rape counseling, and, and, and I had actually had a, f a friend of, of ours who had had a rape experience, and, and we saw what counseling did for her. It really helped her enormously. So um, she said, I went and got counseling. And she said, I, I've been healed, and now I'm a rape counselor. Hmm. Oh, gee. Wow. You know? But she said, I just happened to tune in that night. And, I, and she called me years later to tell me that. And, but I, I, about every month, I get a call like that from somebody who says, you know, I listened to you 30 years ago, you know. And the, now the person's 50 years old, you know. Yeah. I feel older, but... And uh, you changed my life. And, and I don't know how many people could say that, but some of them say it to me. It's very it's humbling. It's an extraordinary thing to it's hear. It's very humbling, you know, because you don't know what, what you're going to say to people. You know, you don't know if it's the right thing. You, you say what you think is right. And Common sense, yeah. Yeah.
I'm just interested in the roots. Um, you, 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 as you say, your life has been about healing, uh, and you happen to be on the radio doing rock and roll show. You're some something of a musician, and it grew into this thing. But what is it in in Bill Ayers that is the font of all this? Um, <clears throat> faith and love. <laughs> you know. Uh, the God that I believe in is a God of love, unconditional love. And as you know, I was a Catholic priest for 13 years. Yeah. And I heard a lot of stories of, from people who had gotten the wrong view. They'd gotten the fire and brimstone stuff, you know, the kind of stuff that a lot of people were taught in our age growing up, right? Yeah, oh yeah. And um, I'd get angry at that because well, I we knew didn't, that these people yeah, I, were being harmed. Yeah. So I, it took me years to get, I didn't know enough <laughs> to get angry at the time that I was being uh, brainwashed. But. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, I, 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 left pre I loved being a priest, you know, and I, I started doing the radio show as a priest and I started to work with Harry when I was a priest. He thought that was really cool, by the way. That <laughs> he and I were teammates, right. you know, partners. And, um, but that's where it comes from. I believe in the presence of the Spirit within each person. And uh, now I do commentary, by the way, on the scriptures. You know that. I, yeah. so I sent them to you. And uh, uh, my pastor said, I said to the pastor one day, he's a friend of mine, I said, you know, people sort of get some of the gospel stories. They have no clue about this other stuff that's going on. And we read this stuff at people all the time and you uh, should have a little introduction. He said, no, 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 you should write something and we'll put it in the bulletin. Hmm. And I've been doing it for almost like three and a half years. And it's, it's been a great thing for my own faith because I sit there and I'm not doing biblical exegesis. You know, I'm, I, I know a lot about that, but I, that's not what I'm doing. I'm trying to relate the scriptures to people's lives. <clears throat> and people say to me, wow, that's, you know, so, so there's something that, that's a gift. It's a gift that, that I've been given of faith. So and, uh, and probably of some of the root of this, the gift is the same thing that led you to the, to the uh, priesthood. And, yeah, and yeah. And yeah. it has survived your leaving the priesthood. No. Yes, I, I, I left the priesthood because I fell in love with a wonderful woman who you know well. <laughs> yes, Janine. I do. Janine is a, is, a, is a terrific woman. And, you know, we both believe in the same thing. And uh, it's been great to have a partner who shares your faith and, and your belief in who God is. And I, I still think that that's one of the big problems in our society. Uh, whether you're Catholic, Protestant, Jew, whatever you are, whatever denomination or no denomination, if, if you don't have a sense of a presence that's a positive presence, whatever you want to call it, in your life, that's not so good. Not so good. There is so much uh, one can benefit from being around this man, listening to this man, or, or at least... Uh, uh, investigating in a little further what he does. You can hear him on WPLJ on Sunday nights, but you can also see his work in, in uh, action at, at whyhunger.org. Right. And I urge you to check that out. Um, it's great to talk to you, as it always is. Well, Thank you for being here. You're, you're my partner for the Hungerthon for many years now, and I love working with you, brother. I do too. Thanks so much, Bill. Peace. And uh, we thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.